<clears throat> Morning, glory, evening, grace, brethren and sisters. Let's have all of you back along with us here this uh, Tuesday evening. Warming up a little bit here in central Alabama. We thank the Lord for his grace and for his mercy and all that he's done in our heart and done in our life. An opportunity that we have to live for him, for the technology that we have here to do these type of videos to help educate the people of God about the word of God and holy living. And we just pray that we would be a blessing to you up here, uh, here this evening. Do uh, keep in mind all the things that we uh, have here at uh at Word Awakening, we'll put out a weekly newsletter if you'd like to get that. You can contact us on uh, on Facebook. Our screen name there is RT Cooper PhD. First two initials RT, then last name is Cooper PhD, having a professional screen name there. And then our email address is uh, drcooperword at protonmail.com. Proton is P R O T O N. drcooperword at protonmail.com. So contact us there, or if you have a prayer request, a praise report, any questions, comments about anything, we would be uh, we would be happy to uh, uh, pass that along to some of our uh, to our other listeners and things. Anything that you uh, stand in need of, of course, also wrote uh, wrote commentaries as well. Got a lot more about to be published. You can contact us for those, or you can go to our publisher, thebookpatch.com, and just search uh, search our name. Dr. Todd Cooper, that's the uh, the uh, title author that we have there for those books, Dr. Todd Cooper. And I uh, get those well, very, very cost effective, like the most expensive one that we've written on Jose is only about, I think, a $3 and something. So very, very cost effective things there. We don't make a profit off of any of that stuff. We just desire to do what God's called us to do, exercise our gift and educate people about the Word of God, being students of the Word of God, how to live a life pleasing to the Lord, and hoping and praying that our result is to see another great awakening. Amen. If you listen to it any time, you know that's where our heart is. Have a heart for revival. Amen. Certainly what we need in this day and time. No doubt we need a revival, but revival comes to those who want it, to those who desire it, to put in the work for it. And that's actually what we're going to be looking at here in a, in a few moments here. So certainly a big need there. And we will take and... uh and uh, be uh, just to begin everything here in uh, in prayer, and uh, so uh, nothing really out of the ordinary that we have to announce here. Just of course our uh, schedule uh, going as planned. Doing the video right now. Thursday we will be doing another midweek video. Our subject is going to be on the kinsman redeemer. Of course, gonna like look at Boaz and Ruth in the Old Testament. Kind of go over that Old Testament law, and then contrast that, of course, to our great ultimate redeemer the Lord Jesus Christ, and so hopefully you'll uh, tune in with us then, and uh, be there, and then continuing our uh, series through the book of Psalms on Sundays, of course, went through the 8th Psalm this last Sunday, what a beautiful, oh, beautiful Psalm that is there, just very, very majestic, so we'll be getting into Psalm 9 this coming Sunday, so if everybody will be, uh, will be with us, and I keep praying, of course, for us and our ministry as we make plans to start a church as well in northern New York. Got a lot of uh, uh, great things going on. Got a lot of uh, great, uh, great, uh, great vision for the uh, great vision for the uh, for the work that we have there. Of course, upstate New York, the main side of the Second Great Awakening. And we've already got some things in mind, like a church history tour, like the city, the town that we're actually starting a church in, Governor, was actually also the site of one of the revivals, one of the earliest revivals that was done, like by Charles Finney and Daniel Nash, of course, like uh, Charles Finney's two uh, prayer warriors, or local, uh, or uh, well, Charles Finney himself was a native of northern New York, he lived right in the Watertown area, and then... Uh, Two of his uh, friends there were natives of the area and were buried there. My like brother Abel Clary, he's buried in Adams, just south of Watertown. And brother uh, Daniel Nash, buried in Lewis County in Allowville. And so, uh, so uh, have, they're both uh, buried there. A lot of, a lot of, a uh, lot of uh, good things uh, there about the year. A lot of great, rich history there with the uh, Second Great Awakening. And so, as we move and we get those things in our progress, we'll certainly get those going as well. Amen. In hopes, hallelujah, of yet another revival. Certainly what we need are people fired up and motivated and excited 
about the things of God. And so we'll go ahead and take, and I have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our study here this uh, evening. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the goodness of sin. We thank you, Lord, for your grace, Lord God, for your mercy, and all that you've done for us, Father God, the opportunity to live for you, the opportunity to open up your word and to uh, see what it says, to speak to us. Thank you for the heart that we have, the gift that you've given us, Lord, to be a blessing of people. Just like Paul told Timothy, that's what this young preacher also desires, is to stir up that gift and just be used of God. Oh, how we need more people to do that, to embrace their gift and to stir it up and use it to its maximum. I'm thankful that we serve a perfect God. We serve an omnipotent God, an omniscient God, a God that has no wind, a God that has no uh, uh, that has no limitations. And I just pray that we would be endued with power from on high, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit, and that Christ would just meet with us here this evening as we try to help the brethren and the sisters in the faith. Pray that we would keep a heart and a mind focused on you, Lord, doing what you'd have us to do, being what you'd have us to be, Father God. Oh, I'll, you know what we stand in need of. Oh, what we stand in need of is another the great awakening is another great moving of you. We need a powerful conviction of sin, and I pray, Lord, that that would come to this world. I know they don't like it, but that's what they need, is to be reputed of their sin, so that they can get their heart right with thee, Father. Just do that work, Lord God. Help those listening. Just help us all get closer and closer in our walk, Father, and be what we ought to be to build your kingdom, and do that work that you'd have us to do, Lord, for it's in Christ that we do humbly pray. Amen. And amen. And so as we uh, mentioned here, our last couple of videos, we said that this was going to be our topic, using a King James Bible, living an NIV life. Using a King James Bible, living an NIV life. So what a, hmm, what a title. What a, uh, what a, what a. Oh, what, a, what a title there, and some of you can uh, could probably kind of know the meaning behind what this is. But now I am an I am unapologetically a King James only independent uh, a fundamental Baptist. Now, yes, I was raised a King James only fundamentalist, but now as a grown man, I am one by conviction, and I wouldn't be anything else. Independent Baptists came big on the scene in the night starting in the nineteen sixties and then through the seventies. Like as other Protestants, as Protestant denominations, like such as Methodists, Presbyterian, Lutherans, and Southern Baptists, started leaving fundamentalism for newly evangelical paths. And throughout the 70s and 80s, it was a safe assumption that just about every independent fundamental Baptist church was committed to holy living and ecclesiastical separation. Of course, ecclesiastical separation, meaning doctrinally, ecclesiastically separated from people who have their own doctrine or from newly evangelicals. However, in the last 20 years, independent Baptist churches have gone way down in standards and their stance against ecumenicalism has went way soft. Now, unfortunately, I have to... Uh, I have to wonder how many pastors would have me preach in their churches, you know, if they read a couple editions of our newsletter or, or they seen some of the videos that we did here. Some might not. <laughs> Speaking of which, you know, the leadership of independent Baptist churches is what's declined. And, you know, you can certainly argue, you know, that's, that's kind of why independent Baptist churches have, uh, have gone downhill so much. Like as the old saying goes, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I suppose that's right regarding this issue. Like some people, you know, who have now gone down, this is kind of more so talking about those people that have really gone full-blown evangelical, you know, like just to, uh, you know, just like to, you know, throw a couple of them out there, you know, like with Tennessee Temple, you know, that's now, you know, like once again, a Southern, like once again, you know, a so I say once again, I don't know if it was Southern Baptist before, but I know now that's like a Southern Baptist school, you know, that is, uh, that has left, you know, the old time way, like when Dr. Lee Robertson was living, you know, that was one of the leading, you know, independent Baptist, you know, colleges, but after he passed away, you know, that school that now was gone, you know, full-blown, newly evangelical Southern Baptist, and the, the same, like, with Trinity Baptist College out in Jacksonville, Florida, like, I know that was, like, previously, even years ago, that was a Southern Baptist school, and then, like, uh, Dr. Uh, Bob Gray, he led that school out of, you know, the convention and made that a King James-only independent fundamental Baptist school, and then when he left, you know, that church and that college, you know, that went back into the Southern Baptist convention and has left, you know, the old-time ways, and King James only anymore, you know, uses contemporary music and everything. 
And then that certainly is also right with this, you know, situation, how even our pastors even want, still is, you know, King James only, Independent Baptist churches, you know, has really, really declined. And thinking about those preachers, you know, that I know when I have met, you know, my main issue with them wouldn't be the things that they do, but more so the things that they didn't do. No, I know that's going to sound like a broken record, you know, coming from me, but the main goal of this ministry, Word Awaking, you know, like we first called according to the Word, but now we call Word Awakening, is to make people students of the Bible. And the sad truth is, is that, you know, like around half the preachers I know are not students of the Bible themselves. Like one an example we have from the Apostle Paul. You know, when he was in jail, even not long before he was going to be martyred, he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.13, when thou comest, bring with thee, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. You know, the parchments being the Bible there, and then his other books. See, an individual, you know, wanting to study the Bible, especially like that, you know, even in jail, a guy's going to be martyred. You know, that's just a far cry, you know, from where the majority of, of today's independent fund of, you know, King James only independent fundamental Baptist church members are. Like, like I heard a I heard a, rel a relatively popular preacher say recently, you know, and he was he was right on, you know, talking about kind of this issue like about books and studying. He said, you know, I don't, you know, I just really don't like carry books with me anywhere when I preach anywhere, you know, and I don't very often, you know, give people books because the sad truth is is that Baptists simply don't read, and how true that is, you know, like there 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 are people who simply who simply do not who do not. Read. They're just not students of the Bible, as they should say. So like I said, even many, many preachers, they just are not, they, they won't read. They're not students of the book. And I know I've had other, like other evangelists, you know, you know, tell me that. Like they said, you know, I just don't, I don't carry a lot of books with me. You know, I, I would do that. But the, the, the sad truth is, is that, you know, most Baptists, you know, they simply won't read. You know, they're not going to purchase. They won't purchase books and you know same with me too that's something that i would do you know like like with my ministry and like the way that i love church history you know i would carry commentaries you know not just ones i wrote but other you know full volume commentaries and like like biographies you know of great preachers and things i would carry them as well to churches you know and uh you know and you know and try to sell them to people but the sad truth is is that baptists are simply people you know that do not read like, like if I go and I purchase a number of books from somebody, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to, uh, you know, get equal the money back. And I certainly wouldn't make a pro, I wouldn't make a pro, I wouldn't try to make a profit off of them. But I mean, if I just sold books, you know, for just a few dollars, the sad truth is, is that there simply are not enough people out there who read, you know, to even really have a ministry, you know, to have a ministry like that as much as it's needed, as much as people should do it. I mean, any any believer in the Word should be a student of the Word. You know, like 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 I said, I was raised in an independent fundamental Baptist church, and you know, I've heard that all my life. Oh, I love that King James Bible. Not King James Bible. I love it. That's what I believe in. Now, I mean, the sad truth is, though, the majority of the crowd that say that, I mean, they spend so little time studying the Bible. You know, that's just not what they invest their time in. You know, like you look at those examples, like like of the Apostle Paul, you know, the, the men of the Bible and certain like the men of church history. Like, like I know I've, you know, probably pounded on a lot and said repeatedly, but, you know, you just see the difference of them. Like Jonathan Edwards, a man who spent 13 hours in his study, 13 hours a day, you know, in his study, you know, writing and studying the Bible. And like those great revivalists, you know, all the time, you know, that they spent you know, studying the Word and praying, you know, that's what the vast array of their life was. That's what the vast array of their life was. You know, they spent it, they spent hours, you know, studying the Word of God and praying. You know, you talk about a revival, you know, that's where a revival comes from. You know, why is it that, uh, you know, that independent Baptist, you know, can't have revival, even though there's so many of them now, like in the Southeast, it's because of that. I mean, they're King James only independent Baptist in name, but they live in an IV life. You know, like I mentioned that before as well, like a, a like a, like a couple of guys who were raised in the same neighborhood, you know, that I was raised in back when back when I was a teenage preacher boy, you know, they, they went to a Southern Baptist church. 
you know, and this, so this would have been, you know, back like around, you know, 2001, 2002, somewhere, you know, around that time frame, you know, and like every single, you know, every single a week, you know, their, their church was doing something, their youth group was doing something in the summertime, you know, like one, one day they were going bowling, one day they were going swimming, one day they were going to a, you know, to a park to play ball, one day they were going to a skating ring. You know, it's like one day out of the week, you know, they, they were doing something, you know, fun through that summer. But there was nothing on there about the Bible. You know, never one time were they going visiting. Never one time were they even having a devotion or anything. But, you know, the truth is, as independent Baptist, you know, so many of them are the same way. You know, their youth activities may not be that way. But, like, like just the members in general, you know, what have they done? You know, have they done anything spiritual? Or are they spending more time on entertainment than they are doing things for the Lord? Because like I often talk to preachers about biblical things, like the history of Israel, the Old Testament law, the contents of books of the Bible, etc. You know, and a lot of those preachers, you know, they give me a puzzled look, you know, they don't have any idea of what I'm even talking about. You know, the sad fact is that we have preachers, you know, in Bible-believing, King James, only fundamental Baptist churches that are biblically illiterate. They don't know anything about it. You know, they know more about sports and television shows and hunting and fishing than they know about the Bible. Because, you know, unfortunately, they spend more time doing recreational activities, you know, than they do studying the Bible. So the very bad result of this is that, you know, these pastors, they don't encourage their people to be students of the Bible. You know, and pastors, you know, they end up having lower standards for their church members. And then we end up with a bunch of shallow deacons, shallow Sunday school teachers, and worldly-minded church members. People, you know, that don't even enjoy church, you know, they find studying the Bible a bore, and they're more interested in ten things of the world than, than anything spiritual. You know, like I've mentioned that before, like I gave my testimony, I believe I was just last Sunday, you know, I mentioned that a time or two. You know, like when I got saved when I was 14, but, you know, before I got saved, you know, when I was just like, you know, a 12, 13 year old boy, you know, I wasn't in the, I wasn't interested in the, you know, in the things of God. And like I, like I said, that exact thing, you know, like, uh, like, like on Sunday mornings, you know, I'd often be, I'd often be more interested, you know, when the NASCAR race coming on, I'm from upstate South Carolina. That's like the, you know, the NASCAR headquarters, you know, where that sport's really, really big. Especially, you know, back when I was 12, 13 years old, you know, like through the, you know, through the 90s, early 2000s. But I was more concerned about the NASCAR race coming on. Yeah, but the fact is, though, is, you know, that, that church that I was raised in that I went to until I was 12, you know, I promise you, 80% of the men in that church couldn't wait until church was over so they could get home and watch a NASCAR race. And I remember that pastor even saying that of that church, he would ask, their race on the day, you know, and he would get up to preach while he was preaching. So he wanted to let people out so they could go watch that NASCAR race. You know, and you wonder, you know, you know why we why we have the problems that we have now. Whenever we're in church, we're not focused on worshiping God. Like one of my favorite verses, I believe that's in Psalm 29 too, where it mentions worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, David said. We're not worshiping the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We're nowhere close to it. Churches nowadays, they don't have the spirit of revival. They don't want to experience the majesty of, of the text like Psalm 8, like we looked at last Sunday. They're more interested in things of the world, even in King James only, independent fundamental Baptist churches. Now yeah, you're King James only, but you don't live it. Like a lot of churches, like I heard a preacher say about that issue, just he preached that message years ago, but I was just listening to it a few days ago. I like what he said. Nike's Independent Fundamental Baptist, they have these doctrinal statements. Yeah, you ought to have a doctrinal statement. I believe that. I've been ecclesiastically separated. But the problem is, is that they hide behind that. They have that doctrinal statement, you know, where they believe in eternal security. They believe in the inspiration and preservation of the scriptures. You know, they believe in the premillennial uh, return of Christ. You know, they believe in, uh, uh, they believe in the, uh, the, that man has a sin nature. And they believe in salvation, repentance, and faith. And all that's good. But the problem is, is that they hide behind it and they do not live the life. That's the problem. They don't live the life. They don't live it. 
I've been in a lot of those meetings, I'll just be honest about it. Like when I was a, a younger man, like a lot of those, you know, what, you know, like revival meetings, you know, like what we had here on video, where you have those week-long meetings, people will go in, they'll go to those meetings, and they'll, you know, like in upstate South Carolina, western North Carolina, where I'm from, you know, and shout her down and everything, you know, shout her down in those, in those meetings, have all the singing and the preaching with people shouting and all. But what did they do, though, when that meeting was over, when they got home? Were they spending time in the Word of God? Were they praying? You know, were they spending time praying? Were they reading the Word of God? Nah, not even close. Not even close. See, I'm, I'm not trying to be ugly or arrogant, but you know, I didn't even mention things like fastings and watchings, like I mentioned throughout our revival. It's probably about half the people in those independent Baptist churches don't even know what that is. Yeah, they would shout her down when those meetings were going on, but whenever they got home, they didn't pick this book up. They weren't in Bible dictionaries. They weren't in commentaries. They weren't praying. They weren't praying for, for God to work in their life. They weren't fellowshipping with God. Oh, they sat in front of the TV for five hours. Their heart wasn't on God. They were in front of the television several, once again, you know, several, several hours a day. More interested on the sale going down at the mall or, or what Walmart or what Target had. Hey, that's people that live a King James Bible, but they live in NIV life. Hey, the King James Bible, we're about to look here. It's full of fruit, hallelujah. Full of fruit. I wouldn't be anything else, wouldn't use, wouldn't pick up anything else. Because this Bible has stood the test of time. And it's full of fruit. Like we did that video about, just about, you know, people being a student of the Word a few weeks ago. You know, like this is the Bible that was used through the Great, the great Awakening revivals, through the, uh, through the Baptist revivals here in the United States in the early 1900s, through the, through the Puritan revivals. It was used by the great preachers, thank God. And it was whenever people started uh, started using these modern translations, like in the 70s and 80s. You know, like whenever this, you know, like American Standard Version, NIV, and New King James, and, and all that came about. I know, that's what led people down the paths of, of newly evangelicalism, and, and while we now have this, you know, New Age modern Christian movement. But you gotta live the King James Bible, though. Oh, we say we love it. Do you really love it? Is that what we spend time in? Is that, is that what we invest ourselves in? What this Bible has to say and the life that it tells us to live? Leviticus 19.2 <clears throat> Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I the Lord your God am holy. Are we holy? I know that text there is talking about the Old Testament law. We don't live under the law anymore, but we're supposed to still live holy lives. We don't have to keep those same, you know, dietary laws and, and, and ceremonial cleanness type laws like, like they did in the Old Testament, but we're supposed to still live holy. It says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We live in holy lives, that holy, that means rising above what this world has. Are we rising above the ways of this world? Unfortunately, you know, we have more, we have people, members of independent fundamental Baptist churches who know more about pop culture and more interested in pop culture than they are the things of God. We're supposed to be a holy people. Have called you as holy. We serve a holy God. Like I was that second, the second Sunday we preached, I, that we preached, I preached that message, biblical holiness. I encourage you to go over our YouTube page and find that message and listen to it. Not because I preached it, because I saw the Bible. Lord, I used that. And I don't know how many texts. I don't know how many. I don't know how many verses of scripture I used in that message. But it was a lot. It was straight from the Bible. Amen. That's what we need. He says, "Be ye holy in all manner of conversation." See, like biblical fellowship. 
There's a lot of people now in Independent Baptist Church. I'm actually going to write an article and do a video on that particularly. Yeah, if I don't say it all here, I'm only going to mention it here. I only plan to. You know about biblical fellowship. See, that's what biblical fellowship is. That's talking about the things of God. You know, what have you been reading in the Word of God lately? Like also Hebrews mentions that. I was reading that in my personal study here this morning. Actually, I believe I actually, I actually mentioned that on that video I did, I did last Thursday about jealousy. And writing that article. But like in Hebrews as well, it mentions that about our conversation being holy. Because see, that's what biblical fellowship is. You know, speaking to the brethren and the sistren about the faith. Like, well, what, what have you been reading in the Word of God lately? What's, what's the Lord been talking to you lately in the Bible? You know, what, what have you been doing for the Lord lately? You know, what type of ministry, you know, does your church has, etc. That's what biblical fellowship is. That's talking about the things of God. You know, what prayer has the Lord answered to you lately? You know, what's been going on, you know, in your spiritual life? That's real biblical fellowship. And to be honest, that's not something, you know, that I really discovered until I became a student of the Word of God for myself. I was one of those as well. You know, fellowship, I was just talking to people that you went to church with about anything. You know, about the ball games, you know, uh, you know what, 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 what good show did you watch on television? You know, what good deal did you get down at the mall, etc. That's not biblical fellowship. Holy in all manner of conversation. See, the fact of the matter is, half our people in independent Baptist churches, they can't even do that there. They don't even have the spiritual maturity to have a holy conversation. Because they don't spend enough time in the Word of God. They don't spend enough time praying. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. We're not supposed to be like this world. We're supposed to be different for, from it. We're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. How do you be renewed by your mind? By what? By that verse we read about the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy. <clears throat> or 2 Timothy, whichever one that was. He told Timothy, bring me the books, especially the apartments. He wanted to renew his mind. Even in his situation when he was under arrest. And he was on the verge of being martyred. He wanted to renew his mind. Because that's how you renew your mind. It's by spending time in the Word of God. Spending time in praying. Having fellowship with God. See, that's one of the, uh, the that's, that's one of the most glorious things about fasting. You know, yes, you know, you fast for a need. You know, like if, like if, uh, like, like especially in this day and time, whenever you talk about fasting for the people that, that do know anything about it, you know, they often say, well, that's if you, that, that's a dire need for something. And yes, you know, it can be a dire, you know, need for something. But not just the needs that you have in your life, especially if you start fasting and you first experience it, you'll see that fasting it's just a sweet, sweet fellowship with God, just like our text says there. You'll see such a renewing of your mind if you fast. Because, see, if you fast, that's what you're going to do. That's the only way you're going to make it, is by reading the Word of God and praying. You cannot make it through a fast, really fasting from anything, but especially food. You cannot make it without having fellowship with God. You've got to pray for, for strength. You've got to pray for a renewed strength. You've got to be in the Word of God, letting God speak to your heart. And that's the most glorious thing about fasting, is that fellowship that you will have with God. You know, not even necessarily, you know, that thing that, uh, that, that you might be fasting about. You know, if there is some type of, you know, some type of dire need, you know, that you are fasting about. It's that sweet fellowship that you have with God. See, the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, that's one thing that just breaks my heart there. In my almost 34 years of living, being around so many people in independent Baptist churches, 
You know, I can just tell by talking and fellowshipping with people. It just breaks my heart how, how, how I know that so few of them have not seek the perfect will of God for their life. You know, they're, they're, just, they're just not there spiritually. Because, you know, I have, I have talked to some good spiritual people in my life. And you can just see that in them, you know, how they've seeked the will of God for their life and they have lived it. But that's what's sad there. How many people have just settled, you know, for mediocrity and have not even really seeked the will of God for their life, the perfect will of God? You know, what God would have them to do? Because you are not going to do that unless you carve out a lot of your time and you spend it in the Bible. You are not going to find the perfect will of God for your life whenever 95% of your time is spent doing worldly things and only 5% of it is spent doing something spiritual. Oh, just how far? Oh, even in our King James only independent Baptist churches, how far have we fallen? I don't, I don't preach this message or say any of this in arrogance, in, in arrogance or or pride. I say it with a broken heart. But oh, how it needs to be preached! Oh, how it needs to be mentioned! Ephesians chapter five and verse number eighteen. And be not drunk with wine wherein is access, but be filled with the Spirit. I know I've used, I believe I used that verse there in another article, another video that I did off top. I can't think of what it was. But be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, you know, thank God in our independent Baptist churches. You know, we've not, as a, as a whole, we've certainly not fallen off the fallen off of that end where we have people drinking alcoholic beverages, openly anyway. And we may not have a lot of people drunk with wine, but we've got people drunk on the world. Like, I believe that's actually what that was when I used that text, was when I did that video about television, the one-eyed God. Because that's the truth. You know, we've got people in our in our independent Baptist churches who are drunk on worldliness, who are addicted to worldly things, who are addicted to television, who are addicted to worldly entertainment. Just drunk with, drunk with worldliness. That we are supposed to be filled with the Spirit, not drunk on things of the world, not addicted to things of the world, but filled with the Spirit of God. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, oh, are we living Christ? Are we defeating the flesh? And is, is Christ living in us? Is Christ showing in us? We're like an independent Baptist church here in Alabama. You know, it's, it's Alabama and Auburn football that lives in so many people. Like a lot of people, you know, they even have that on their car license plate. You know, they'll have their initials. You know, like a D-L-R-T-R. -R, like, you know, their initials, D-L, and then R-T-R -R for Roll Tide Roll. Or, you know, like a J-E for A-U-F-B. Like, you know, J-E for A-U Auburn University F-B football. We have people who are addicted to all that stuff. Who are addicted to all that stuff. And all that stuff is living in, living in them, but not the Word of God. I'll just think about that, amen. Like, why do people in the Southeast got as excited about the, about the things of God as they do college football on Saturdays? No, it's not me that lives. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. No, if people would do that. If they would really, really let Christ live in them. Titus 2.14. In Titus 2.14 it says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity? And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. A peculiar people. See, we are to be a peculiar people. 
And that's left us in our independent Baptist churches. We have people out there who will not, who will not think twice. Who will not even consider, you know, heeding to the things that I've talked about in this video. Why? Because they'll be a peculiar people. Well, I can't spend all my time reading the Bible and praying. People will think I'm odd. We're supposed to be a peculiar people. You know, that's why Independent Fundamental Baptists, you know, back in the 70s and all, when they started to get, you know, bigger, that's why we took the stand that we did. Because we are to be a peculiar people. We're not going down the newly evangelical path. We're not bringing the world into our churches. Yeah, just in this last, you know, 20 years or so, the world has came back into our churches to its members. Because we have people who are more, who are more and more and more concerned about the things of the world than they are the things of God. We're supposed to be a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Yet, you know, we have people zealous about everything else. About everything else that the world has to offer. More about the sports, more about the, more about the recreation, more about the movies. And see, look at how staunch Moses was. You think, you think what I'm saying is something. Look at how staunch Moses was when he was instructing the people of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 to 9. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine head, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house, and on thy gates. Whoo! He said morning, evening, and at all times in the middle, the Israelites were to teach their children the law. Now, how far we've fallen, amen. How far we have fallen. People, they're going to say, well, Moses, it just sounds so fanatical. I'm not doing it. No, they won't be fanatical about the things of God, but they'll be fanatical about everything in the world, amen. That's just like I said, like Moses said there, they would have put that on their, they would have put that on their doors and on their gates, the law, the word of God. And just like I just said, like you've got people now, you know, that they put all, they put all the sports things on their doors and on, on their cars, on their, you know, everywhere else, all the clothes that they wear. Got people who invest all the money and all this worldliness. Invest all their money and all their time. They just unfortunately not not even close to what Moses says here. Not even close to it. How many parents are teaching their kids the word of God? How many parents are having devotions with their kids, teaching them first the gospel, most important thing? Like what I'm doing now with my daughter, who will be five years old next month. She's starting, just kind of starting to come to that age, you know, of understanding. Like me and my wife, you know, we're telling, the, telling her, you know, the gospel as much as we can at, at her level. Then how many parents, you know, are going to go, are going to go on after that and teach their kids the statutes of the word of God. See, we have deacon Sunday school teachers, ushers, choir members, etc. And independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, who do good to read three chapters of the Bible in a week. See, and like I said, you know, in accordance with the young people, you know, what a collapse we've had there. I praise the Lord for the godly teenagers that we do have in independent Baptist churches that are carrying the torch for the next generation. You know, but this is usually the exception and not the norm because the majority of the young people I know in independent Baptist churches, they have zero interest in the things of God. And like this, you know, wasn't initially in my, or in this article, but like I know I mentioned I know I mentioned this at a time or two before in a video or two and in an article or two. By the majority of the people we have, young people, you know, when they leave their houses, move out of their houses, they don't go to church anywhere. 
And that's especially true of independent Baptist churches. I mean, even even in some parts of the Bible Belt, like here in central Alabama, you know, you go to independent Baptist churches, I mean, you have so, so, so few people like my age and my generation. Like people in their 20s and 30s, you know, they're almost non-existent in independent Baptist churches. You know, the vast, vast array of them are like 50 years old and older. You know, we have had a big, a big falling away there. But they're not interested in the things of God, like the youth, the teenagers, the young adults. Nah, they're into rock and rap music, using tobacco products, going to movie theaters. Sometimes, you know, even even, even trying to get into drugs and into drinking alcohol. And unfortunately, this is often the children of deacons and Sunday school teachers and people that hold <clears throat> that hold offices in churches. Like what does the Bible say in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and verse number 11? Ephesians 5, 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. So the sad truth is, even though a lot of the leadership in our independent fundamental Baptist churches they have the works of darkness in their own very houses. <coughs> they allow their kids to listen to that trash on the on the radio and watch trash movies. Watch all these har watch all these R-rated horror movies. There are pastors who know that their deacons, Sunday school teachers, and other church leaders have ungodliness going on in their homes. They stay silent about it. They just ignore it. See, formerly the the great majority of independent fundamental Baptist churches, you know, held the standard that the church leaders and all in their houses had to abstain from tobacco, Hollywood movies, worldly music, etc. And I'm thankful for the pastors and churches that still have these holy standards, but they are becoming a small minority. See, previously, a King James only, independent fundamental Baptist, was known as one that lived a separated life, holy unto God. See, now we've sadly, we have a great multitude that use a King James Bible, but they live an NIV life. <clears throat> They've let all this worldliness come into churches through their own members. And they don't stand against sin. Like they once did. Want to see a great move of God, friend? You've got you've to separate. You've got to separate from that trash. Said it ruins, it ruins. It ruins a testimony. It ruins your spiritual life. But you know, we have people who just proudly, who proudly boast it. They proudly boast going to that, going to that movie theater and seeing that horror movie. Or seeing that filthy movie. Listening to that trash on the radio station. You know, loud, with the loud speakers up and everything. People who go to a King James only independent fundamental Baptist church, but they're living an NIV life. And that's why we've had such a falling away. That's why we are in the situation that we're at in 21st century America, because we've compromised with that. We've compromised our standards, amen. And that will not happen, I'll tell you publicly. That will not happen, I'll take a stand. That will not happen in the church that I start. Won't happen. People who hold offices, they are to live holy, godly, separated lives, amen. Yes, I know, you can lose, you can lose a lot of people by taking that stand. Because I know, I know like a lot of church planners and like a lot of missionaries, they have to do everything their self. You know, they have to lead singing, they have to teach Sunday school, you know, do the preaching, and I know that's taxing. I know that's difficult, I know that's not easy, but I'd rather have a clean conscience and have a clean account with God than I would to have carnal people holding those offices in my church. Amen. We are to desire holy, holy Godly people in leadership positions in our church, I mean, people who are members of our church, people that have a heart for God. Yes, of course, you know, anybody, 
anybody, you know, ought to be able to come into a ought to be able to come into a church and sit in the pews and hear preaching because you know, hearing this kind of Bible preaching, I know it's not popular. That's not what most people want, but that is what they need to hear, amen. They need to hear the gospel. And even, you know, half-hearted Christians, if they are really saved, if they are really Christians, you know, like this half-hearted crowd that we've been talking about, like we use the terminology half-hearted, really more so it's a 95% heart for the world and just about a 5% heart for the things of God. You know, those people need to be under this kind of preaching, but, you know, most of them won't. The fact of the matter is, most of them reject it. And that's unfortunately, that's what they want to be a part of. They want to be a part of a church that's more worldly, that's more carnal, that's not going to take a stand against things like that. Because they want to go back out, and smoke their cigarettes, and chew their chew their to you know chew their tobacco and everything, and go to their and go to their movies and and spend all day you know watching watching the ball games, watching the television. But that's why we got the problem that we have, amen. That's why we have the problem that we have. That's why our churches are so dead, even our King James only independent Baptist churches. They're so dead. And what we need is the conviction of sin. Like I've said before, I like going to a church where I feel conviction, amen. I like going to a church like that, where a man of God's not afraid to preach it straight, amen. Oh, that's the heart those great revivalists had. That's the heart that I've got. I don't want any leisure. That's what I put on my prayer list. I'll be honest with you. It's on my prayer list. I'll show it to you. I told God, I said, Lord, I want you to have strict discipline on me. You limit my leisure time. May that leisure time I have be limited, limited, limited. I want all the hours, all the waking hours that I have. I want them to be in prayer. I want them to be in the Word of God, Amen. Even if God, if the only thing that 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 God really ends up wanting me to do, I know it's not the only thing that He wants me to do because I have this ministry here, writing books and newsletters. But you know, if the vast array of my ministry just went to a ministry of prayer, like Brother Abel Clary and Daniel Nash, if it went to just a prayer and a fasting meet and a fasting ministry. You know, for revival, for the power of God, you know, to maybe even be on another another traveling evangelist or something. That's something I would gladly do if that's what God wanted me to do. You, yeah, because you live the ministry of prayer and fasting, friend. Thank God you live the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. There ain't nothing no more important than that. Because if somebody out there, if they want to do that for me, that's what I pray for. Hallelujah. And I know I've got one. I've got a prayer partner. I've got, a, I've got a good brother that prays and fasts for me, and I thank the Lord for me, amen. I've actually been meaning meaning to tell him there was a, there was an individual who I thought could be a brother to me. I know this is kind of, this is, might be kind of personal, but the Lord wants me to say it. I'm, I'm just telling you what, the, what can happen if you sell out to God. I had an individual who I thought was going to be like a brother to me, but he turned away from me. He started criticizing me because he lives the life of what I mentioned here. He goes to a church that uses the King James Bible, but he lives an NIV life, and he's got a bunch of carnality in his house. But some time ago, about a year or so ago, he was just criticizing me, and he was putting me down. But I guess you could kind of say in his place, a guy who could have been like a brother to me, God sent me somebody else. God sent me a prayer partner. He sent me a Daniel Nash and Abel Clary, a man that prays and a man that fasts with me. Amen. And oh, that's what we need. It said King James Bible is full of fruit. That was the Bible that they used in that first great awakening, that second great awakening. I'm glad it's full of fruit. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch anything else. I wouldn't. I won't mess with nothing else. But we got to live it. Amen. We got to live it. You can't go wrong. That's the only, that's the only life to live. The only life to live. See, that's what we get from the law. I'm writing that commentary right now on Leviticus. That's what we get from the Old Testament law. You know, they were not to touch carnal things. They had, they had, they had very, very strict ceremonial cleanness that they had to observe. And even though we don't live by all of their dietary laws and all the, and all the commandments that they had then, we're supposed to be like that in our spiritual life, not touching the world. Amen. That's why it's best not even touch it. Don't touch Hollywood. 
don't touch any of that trash, amen. Stay as far away from it as you can, especially, amen, if it's going to hinder your testimony. We thank you for listening to us here this evening. Just kind of gave a little bit of our heart again. It's probably what a man of God ought to do. He ought to exposit the word, but also ought to give his heart. Of course, we've shown you, we've shown you the word of God. <clears throat> and it really doesn't take a rocket scientist to comprehend this stuff. Oh, you want to be used to God. You want the real power of God on your life. Amen. You got to live the life. I like what that great Puritan John Owen said. He said, before a man preaches a message, he's got to preach it to his own heart. And the only power that's going to be behind that message is the life that he lives. Amen. No, you got to live the life to have the power. Yeah, you ought to have a King James Bible. But you got to live it too. The King James Bible, amen, it's full of, it's a book about holiness. It's full of holiness. That's what it's all about. So thank you so much for tuning in here this evening. I hope we were a help and a blessing to you. You know, we preach this message really with a broken heart and with all the humility that we have. Like, like I hope y'all know me. I'm a person who stays far, far away from, from pride. That's nothing to get proud about. Not at all anything to get proud about, but you know that's that's just a message that is needed for this day and time. If we are if we are going to have another revival, like I said, I challenge you. The most important thing that you can read and study is the King James Bible. But by my opinion, I guess you could just say the second most important thing is is go get some biographies. You know, go get some books about that first great awakening, that second great awakening. You know, go read the biography of of George Mueller, of John Wesley, of Jonathan, of Jonathan Edwards, of George, George Whitfield, Charles Finney, and those, and those men. You see the life that they live. You see all the time that they spend in prayer and in the Word of God. Like I said, ladies, you know, like I've mentioned, I had a heart for that. We just had Mother's Day. Go read the biography of Susanna Spurgeon, Susanna Wesley, some of these godly ladies who have lived and see all the time that they invested in the Word of God and teaching their children the things of God. Because, oh, that's certainly, certainly what we need in this day and time. We don't need any more half-hearted Christians. We don't need a church that's in love with the world. We need a church that's in love with the Word of God and that's in love with holy living that wants more and more of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus said it best, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. World will never, ever fill you up. But Jesus, amen, he will, he will satisfy. <clears throat> So thank you so much for listening to us, dear brethren and sistren. I honestly, I don't know anybody. That, I don't know of any of you who listen to me that live, you know, that live an NIV life. Like I often say, those of you who I know who listen, y'all are the cream of the crop. I know it. I know you have a you have a full blown heart for God. And I know you want a revival and you are separated. And hallelujah, that's what we need. I know we're a small remnant. But we need to pray that that remnant would get a little bit bigger. Amen. And this fire for revival would spread. This desire for holy living would spread. Amen. So come back and be with us uh, Thursday. Actually, be uh, be with us Thursday. Certainly going to be in a different direction. Going to be looking at the Kingsman Redeemer and uh, and uh, how uh, that applied in the Old Testament and then with Jesus Christ being, of course, the ultimate Redeemer in the New Testament. So come be with us then. Amen. And we'll feast on the Word of God once again. And I hope everybody has a wonderful week, has a great couple of days until we see you Thursday or whenever you can tune into this. Uh, so. Uh, so I uh, do thankful, thank, thank, thank the Lord for each and every one of you and uh, the blessing that all of you are to me and the prayers. I know I've got some prayer warriors out there, like I said, and I don't take that for granted. That, that's what I desire. That's what I need. Amen. In this perilous time, you know, we need one another, we need to be praying for one another, loving one another, encouraging one another in this uh, day and time that we live in. So we'll dismiss in a word of prayer. Our Father, we sure do love you. We thank you for the innocence of sin. I thank you for those wonderful people that do listen, Lord God, our wonderful believers, those that love me, those that uh, those that have a heart for you. I just pray that you'd continue to use them in a mighty, mighty way. Lord, thank you so much for their prayers, for all that they do for our ministry. Like I know some of these people, you know, they've even thought so much of us that they have donated financially to our ministry. And that's wonderful, you know, to have partners. That's the way I see it. You know, that's what I want these these final supporting churches that we're trying to get. I want them to be partners in revival. That's what I desire for people who are fired up, who love the Word of God, and who love holy living, who want to see another great awakening, another revival, because that certainly is what we need. And I pray you just keep us, Lord, by your grace and by your mercy. And that you would lead, you would guide and direct us, Lord God. Like I was praying there I, with, with a broken heart. 
it hurts me, Lord God, that I see so many people who just really have not seeked the perfect will of God for their life because they've just been more concerned about the world. But I pray that more would seek your perfect will, Lord God, and you'd raise up some more godly men. You'd raise up some more godly women, Lord God. If that's church planners or if that's people that just give themselves to the ministry of prayer and fasting, you've given everybody a gift and you've got something for all of us to do. And I just pray we would live that out. And that we would just do what we ought to do, Lord, to build your kingdom. I know it's uh, this day and time, it feels a lot like post-exilic Israel. Uh, I feel like a Haggai or, or an Ezra, Lord God, trying to rebuild North America, a place that was so wonderful a couple of hundred years ago. But we've gone the other way. We've gone into worldliness, Lord, and our churches have even lost its power. But I pray we would do that work, Lord God. We would do that work that Haggai did, that Ezra did, that Zechariah did, that Nehemiah did, that we would rebuild. We would rebuild this wall of holiness that we would rebuild the house of God, the one that you are acceptable with. If there's one lost, convict them and save them. One discourage, encourage, one backslide, reclaim them, and just lead God and direct in the way that you would have us to go in our hearts and in our lives. Bless our dear listeners, we pray until we meet again, Father. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, folks. I am Dr. Cooper, and we will see you Thursday evening.